Hi, Cody Cast listeners. We are back, and today we have a very, very special guest. And uh, we actually spoke to this gentleman a couple of weeks ago on Clubhouse, and I actually couldn't get enough of his wisdom. So what we decided to do was get him in for our Cody Cast podcast. So thank you for joining us today, Eric Sim. Woohoo! Thank you. Thanks, Lisa, for having me. It was so fun at our Clubhouse event. And uh, yeah, when you say let's do a podcast, I <laughs> jump right in. Fantastic. So look, you're in my eyes like a LinkedIn superstar slash hero slash guru. You've got almost three million people on LinkedIn who are following you, which is incredible. So a massive congratulations for that. Yeah. Thank, thank you. I, I usually say uh, over 2 million. I'm still still a bit of a way to, to 3 million. <laughs> oh, you are very close. Don't You're just being modest now. Yeah. But, but I think the interesting thing about you is that you wear multiple hats. So you're not just a, you know, a huge social media influencer, but you actually started your career as managing director of UBS and you were also yes. a lecturer and you founded uh, Institute of Life, which is an online uh, e-learning platform which trains young professionals to be more successful at work and life so you are a very busy man Eric yes uh, <laughs> indeed I, I like to keep myself busy I I can't I can't be sitting uh, on the beach so on the beach so my idea of holiday is uh, traveling around giving speeches and talking to local people so if if you ask me, you know, if you give me like a three day vacation at a beach resort, I will turn it down, no matter <laughs> how beautiful the beach resort is. So you're like I, me, I just can't do that. workaholic. But that actually suggests to me that you love what you do, which is fantastic. Yeah, I don't call myself a workaholic. I'm actually enjoying. Uh, what I do and I'm, I'm having fun. I mean, to, to imagine that I can fly to Bahrain with three, 400 people waiting to hear me speak, you know, and before I spoke, I got a chance to uh, try the local food. So the, the moment I, I land, I check into the hotel within five minutes, I hop onto a taxi and ask the taxi driver, take me to the most popular <laughs> local food where I can eat chicken with rice, then you say, okay, bro, chicken biryani, let, let me bring you to this place. So I went, it's super local, I'm the only tourist there. Oh my God, you're making me hungry <laughs> yeah. now. Where's actually the most interesting place you've been? I've been to many, um, from Japan and I China. Japan. And of course, the, the place I go, is it, it, not the touristic places. Mm. Like Japan, I'll go to some onsen where... Uh, foreigners are not allowed, so I got so I got my ways of pretending to be local people. Oh, I like and, that um, though. I think that's I, the best way. The best uh, way to actually discover a new country or a city. It's actually almost like try and go where the locals go, as opposed to where all the tourists are going. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for touristic places, I just watch them on YouTube. You know, if I want to watch Eiffel mm. Tower, if I want to see Eiffel <laughs> Tower, I can just go to YouTube and 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 see it. Yeah, and uh, sometimes I go to places. Um, it could be different parts of uh, India, could be different parts of um, even Singapore, right? Yeah, I'm a Singaporean. I try to travel through time. Oh, wow. Instead of space. What do I mean by that is um, Singapore is a very small place, as, as you know but it has a lot of history as well. Mm. So I'll go to the same place and try to understand what happened two, 300, 700 years ago. And uh, we, I was very surprised that there was already uh, thriving um, trading activities uh, several hundred years ago. Oh, that's really interesting, yeah. actually. As far, that's... Back as, seven, as far back as 700 years, yeah. That's insane because you started off your industry, uh, your career actually in... Uh, banking and finance so that would that concept yes. of trade and barter would no doubt be quite interesting to you given your background yeah yeah so i'm, I'm thinking why you know what's the value of this place mm. um, so I, I i like to do that so I, when i go to a local place i try the food try to find out the the history the heritage and sometimes you can discover uh the heritage through food that means how did this food 
come about. Yeah, I like love in that. In Korea, where um, they they serve uh, burnt rice in soup. Oh, so that's... they intentionally burn the rice and then they pour some soup and then they serve. So why why is that? Because I think during war time when you run out of uh, food, you scrape even the burnt rice oh. and you try to make use of it. And then of course now there are no shortage of uh, food, but still that tradition um, stays because your tongue has memory. So what you eat when you're young or when you're young stays on and then you will pass on to your kids because they got no choice but to eat what you like to eat. And that, that continues yeah. uh, until a major disaster crisis uh, happened. If not, right, you can still see very affluent people still eating really um, cheap food sometimes, you know, in, in their diet. I think that's that's because that- of the memory yeah and i think that's definitely something that's quite big in asia obviously that tradition so uh, i know that yes. yeah there's probably a lot of things like you said that, that we could be eating now which might taste better better than burnt rice but people are still wanting to not let go of that tradition which is beautiful so uh just to go back a little bit so obviously you are traveling the world well maybe doing more things uh, digitally at the moment, but you are um, encouraging people in their careers. But uh, a couple of years ago, you were quite new to social and now you've amassed an amazing community around you. So can you tell us a little bit about how you actually did that? Because I'm sure a lot of our listeners were really curious how you start from obviously going from no connections to almost (laughs) just under 3 million. Yeah. So uh, in 2015, I, um, I was already teaching uh, quite a bit in the universities. Then my students come to me for career advice, you know, and I didn't have time to do one-to-one. And because they are asking sometimes uh, pretty much the same, you know, how do I plan my career? How do I um, connect with people? How do I get to the insider? So I decided to say, okay, why don't I write somewhere, choose one platform and I start writing. And every time a student asks me, I'll just forward the link. Oh, fantastic. So that's how I started. Yeah. So when I first started, I think I have a couple of hundred uh, connections, but these are colleagues, ex-colleagues. Um, I wasn't active, just people adding me. And uh, if I know them, I accept. So that's how I started. And at the beginning was really writing for students. After that, I find that uh, some young professionals who are already working also find my content pretty useful. Then I include them in my writing as well because I also taught uh, EMBA and MBA. And then for EMBA students, they are quite senior, at least 10 years to, to, to like 15 years experience. Some of them already in the like, uh, junior or mid-career. Yeah, sometimes CFO of, of a small, medium company. And after that, uh, I branch out to uh, beyond banking finance, so lawyers, so uh, auditing firm, like the big four audit, right? The PwC, KPMG, Ernst & Young, uh, Deloitte. So they also uh, kind of like my content and then I I expand beyond Asia. So initially it was just Asia because I thought my because I never really work uh, outside of Asia. I, I work six months on, uh, in London, but I don't think I know the West uh, as much as uh, I like to. Surprisingly, my content also resonated uh, with Western or international readers. So then, yeah, I expand now kind of uh, more, more global. As you can see, sometimes on my Clubhouse or my LinkedIn Live, a very, very, very international audience. Yeah, fantastic. And actually on the topic of Clubhouse, might move on to our um, first segment, which is called Trend Watch. And uh, we need to get a, a jazzy opener happening. But um, this is yes. where we talk about what's happening in the industry and some key trends. So Clubhouse is one of those massive, massive um, shifts in, it's actually the app itself has influenced significant shift in the functionality of all the other major platforms and that's actually where we met because I remember being in a yes. clubhouse room about LinkedIn you and I both obviously uh, 
you know, very passionate about LinkedIn. I can see your, um, is that like a LinkedIn trophy in the background? I don't know what that is, but I definitely want yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. So uh, on that my right top down here, uh, you can see a LinkedIn logo. So that's my 2019 uh, Spotlight Award from LinkedIn China. Oh my God, congratulations. 2019. Yeah, and uh, here below <laughs> is my LinkedIn Singapore 2020. And down here, not lighted up, um, is my LinkedIn China Spotlight 2020. So 2020, I got award from two countries. Oh, and I was wow. told by LinkedIn, I'm, I should be the first person to get award from two countries. Because in Olympics, you cannot represent two countries, <laughs> right? <laughs> we're doing something right on LinkedIn. So we definitely will have to uh, talk about that later on. So we might just quickly yes. go back to Clubhouse because I've, I'd have i love to get your thoughts on Clubhouse and what you think of the platform mm -hmm. because it's obviously sure. the, the fastest growing or one of the fastest growing at the moment. So how have you found it to be useful for, say, building personal brand or, say, leads or your business? I think um, mainly is to build rapport with, uh, with people. So on LinkedIn, which most of us are very familiar, is good for building credentials and trust. Because if you come to my profile, you can see where I work, you can see my connection. So usually it will give you some trust level because you know if I say I'm a junk associate professor at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, 95 or 99% is going to be true, right? If it is not true, I'm not going to I wouldn't dare to put that in. And if I've got a few thousand followers, I don't need a, a million. You know, if a few thousand followers or connection, you know, likely this is going to be true. Otherwise, people will report my uh, profile. But the building the rapport is a bit slow because the, you cannot hear the voice and the engagement is not live. Clubhouse, on the other hand, I find myself collaborating with people that I just got to know a day you know just like you you say hey let's let's do a clubhouse room then i say yeah let's 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 do it because from your voice i can and your content the way you engage i i can i can get a feeling that hey i like you enough i can trust you may the trust level may not be as high as on linkedin but it's good enough for me to take a chance on the person so I think that's the magic of, of that. And also, you know, we, we, we cannot see each other, so we can cut that out. Just listening to the voice. I think there's something magical, just listening to somebody's voice. The accent, the energy level can tell you so much about the person's personality. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that, that's why the, the rapport building is so quick. On, on that platform against any other. Like Instagram, you cannot you don't, you don't even know the person's credential. You haven't heard, you just see a photo, you know, it can be real, can be fake, it can be completely opposite of what they portray. So Instagram is not so good for a partnership until a, a long period of time. So yeah, I guess that's that, that authenticity. I think you can really hear when someone's passionate about what they talk about or what they do or whether they're even confident about it. And you're so right about Instagram. You can literally post content and even to some degree, LinkedIn and Facebook and TikTok, like you can create content in advance and post it. So the, the good thing about Clubhouse is people who are so-called experts uh, but actually not are really getting exposed on Clubhouse because there's nowhere to hide. So if you're calling yourself a LinkedIn expert and you get up on stage and someone asks you an easy question about LinkedIn and you can't answer it because you've just create like crafted this fake brand about you know being an expert, like you will quickly get exposed. So I feel like with Clubhouse, there's a, a, a almost like a much higher level of authenticity because there's nowhere to hide. Like you're literally going to get asked a question yeah. and then yeah. you've got to answer. So it. I I can. The, the, absolutely. Um, I can tell uh, quite quickly uh, whether a person is a fraud or not, mm. right? Um, instead of giving value to the listener, you are just asking people, hey, I got a free 
uh, download on my LinkedIn, you know, I've done this, I've done that, please go then and download, you know. If you're really giving, if you really know your stuff, you can give three tips immediately. Mm. Bang, right there in three minutes. Mm. You know, there's no need to ask. But of course, this is a strategy to ask somebody to download something, you get their email, then you try to sell them something. You know, that, that strategy I can see through uh, very, very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. At, the house, yeah. yeah, well, um, just on the topic of um, just trends... Sorry, I, I just realised we just keep talking and uh, I could talk to you all day. I actually wanted to sit yeah. on the clubhouse with okay. you for hours just listening. Uh, so clubhouse has obviously mm-hmm. influenced LinkedIn, who are developing their own version, Facebook, um, Twitter. So what do you think about audio? Because I know that, and something that you actually mentioned in our clubhouse was talking about the fact that it's just going to become a function that's now like stories and just available on all platforms. Yes, I think it will be available on all platform. Um, but what's the key difference are who's on it. Mm. Just like photos, right? Mm. You can post photos on all social media, mm. including Twitter, which is not really known for, for photo. It's really known for text. But photo is, uh, you can post, but what do you post? Mm. You know, Instagram photo and LinkedIn photo are quite different, although it's the same feature. So audio is going to be the same. I envisage the LinkedIn audio chat. We're going to talk about career mostly. We're going to talk about personal development. For example, I can go on the audio chat on LinkedIn to teach people how to do up a CD. Mm. Or how do you answer uh, interview questions? Mm, That's a good one. So how do you answer this question, tell me about yourself. This is likely the first two, three questions that you get asked during a job interview. Mm. And what, what tips would you have for people trying to answer that question well? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, that, that will be another podcast. <laughs> um, so so that, I think, is going to be very relevant on, uh, on LinkedIn. And mm-hmm. you don't need visual to teach people that, mm. uh, how, how to ace an interview. Uh, and of course, if you want to do that, uh, you need storytelling. You need to reveal a weakness because most people will say, I'm creative, I'm hardworking. You know, I do this, I've got this, all this achievement. Uh, but that doesn't tell the story. You, you will not come across as somebody different from the other candidates. Yeah. So it's trying to work out then what is your USP and then making sure you clearly communicate that. Yeah, definitely. So. If Facebook is also coming out with its own version of uh, audio chat, but Facebook will be among, more, I think, among friends. Mm-hmm. And it will be a uh, more casual lifestyle topic. For example, food. Fine dining food. You know, let's have a room, just talk about fine dining food or your local food or the local places to, to visit. You know, so it will be based on uh, interest group. Mm, that's a good one. That's a good point, actually. Yeah, so, so I think we, because it's easier to say, hey, uh, I'm in this industry, I'm in performing arts, uh, singing, how do you sing better or how do you speak better, drama, then we can form a group. Then after we open up to people who are interested. Mm. So I think it's like, it, it will be based on, on, on interest. Then I think on Clubhouse, because they have started with uh, artists, yes. could be actor, could be singer. I think they may go along that line. Uh, eventually, when you have more option, if you want to talk about career, you go to LinkedIn audio chat. You want to talk about food, you go to your Facebook group because food, chances are, is people who are close to you. Mm, mm, mm. You know, it's difficult to say, I want to talk about food with Americans, with British, you know, with, with Asian. It, it doesn't really quite work. It will be your local community people who are fiscally close to you in the same country. Then on, on uh, Clubhouse will be singer and actor, you know, they're exchanging tips. And then for people like me, if I want to learn how to sing, yeah, I can go there and listen and get some advice. Fantastic. Well, that's great. And I, I do agree with your breakdown of the different categories. I think that that's where it's going to really probably go because I know 
personally, like I'm finding Clubhouse, like I was full on into it at the start and now I just yeah. realise it's so much time. So I think when Insta- uh, when LinkedIn launched their rooms and their audio feature, I think I'll probably be a bit more active on there because – and I don't know if it'll be similar to you and I'd love to know your thoughts on this because, we, like, you know, we've already got an audience there. So we're not trying to build something yeah. from scratch. Yes. So uh, what, what I'm doing is I'm doing the new Clubhouse on LinkedIn. Ah, yes. So I did – yeah, so what I'm doing now, I've, I've been doing it uh, um, every other week. So if, if you are interested, you know, happy to, um, to, to, to jump on it. Yes. So I have a LinkedIn Live. And um, for my LinkedIn Live, usually I have a few guests. Most of my guests, they will not be able to turn on their video. Mm. So if I invite you, Lisa, to, to, be, a, to be my guest uh, on LinkedIn Live, only my video is on, your video is not on. Then any other guests, any other speakers, even from the audience, right? Uh, their video will not be on. So what I'm doing is uh, Zoom. So I, I, have it, I started with Zoom, just like what we are doing now. Halfway through LinkedIn Live, I send out my Zoom invite. Then when I send out a Zoom invite, suddenly like maybe about a third of those uh, of the audience who are watching jump onto Zoom and join us. But their audio, the their their video is disabled, so everybody come in just with a name, ah, and they can speak. Ah, that's fantastic! So the only person they see is me, and so maybe it's my um live uh, production manager from LA, and um, only him or my teaching assistant. But everybody else, no. So you get a clubhouse view; you can see their name, but this is better than Zoom only. Because if it's a Zoom only, everybody is strangers. Mm. But because the first part is LinkedIn Live, mm. you can already check out some people. Mm. You're already familiar. Plus, um, because I do this regularly, like at least once a month, I've got some regulars who will join. Yes. So after two or three sessions, right, you'll see, okay, that's Lisa Fei. Oh, <laughs> um, you know, she, she spoke the last time and then she was on Clubhouse with, Lee, with Eric and then uh, she recently did a podcast here. so you are not a stranger anymore yes so when you come on to zoom when you speak there's a context yeah fantastic i love that yeah uh so this is the new clubhouse number one at the beginning i can share my screen so oh, if, yes, I want to good teach, one. if i want to give a few tips on on linkedin i can share my my screen and people will be able to, to watch um, LinkedIn Live for, say, half an hour, then they jump in. So I break it down, the, my whole process, into uh, three parts. LinkedIn Live is the middle. Before that, I have got an uh, event check. It's called the cocktail party. So 20, about one day before my actual event, we form a check group. So at your own pace, you can come in and uh, start talking to say how excited you are, what are the questions, and I'll get my fellow speakers. So just a few days ago, I've got Frank Ku, who is the Asia, uh, LinkedIn Asia Head of Talent Solution and oh, wow. Learning Solution to join me. Um, it's a fantastic leader. So before even the actual event, attendees can already start chatting with him. Oh, that's great. Then you listen to him speak and me speak. After that, we have the after party. <laughs> after the link. So I will turn off LinkedIn Live. Everybody jump on Zoom. Usually it's a smaller group because after about an hour, most people um, got other things to do. So they, they, they'll go off. So the last time I have about uh, 35 people just on Zoom, audio only. That's amazing. And that gives that intimacy. Yes. And the, um, so I have about half the people who are regular, the other half are new. But the new one, after a while, they become regular as well. So you get to experience three things. So I think this is the, the, new, the new clubhouse where you know the person and the trust level, I think, is higher because you can check people's uh, LinkedIn profile. Yes, which is fantastic. And that's something I think Clubhouse are working on potentially a a direct link to people's LinkedIn accounts that they can hook up to their clubhouse. But I, it's a very easy technical um, enhancement. Uh, they are not doing it. I think there is a reason. Ooh. 
if they want to do it, it can be done it within a day. Interesting. It, it's not difficult. You heard it here yeah. first. What are you so, waiting for, Clubhouse? What are you scared of? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but yeah. no, I, I think you must look at also who are the investor behind, mm. right? The investor behind may may have uh, some plans, right? Yeah, because it's actually quite, uh, it, it, it doesn't take a, <laughs> it, it doesn't take a genius to know that here yeah, a link to LinkedIn uh, makes absolute sense, right? Yeah, exactly. But so I think they're probably... The developer, the founders, uh, they don't need us to tell them. They, they already know it. Yeah. So if they want to do it, it can be turned on uh, within a day. Yeah, interesting. So they're probably worried about maybe losing some market share. But uh, look, those are all great tips on how to really keep your audience engaged and build a community. And that's something that really stood out to me when we were having a chat on Clubhouse and, and just listening to some of your conversations. Like you really take the time to engage in your audience and you, uh, you know, take like you actually take your community very seriously and you put in time and that's what a lot of people don't do. So um, massive congratulations to you. I think that's a, one of the, you know, really crucial things that you need to do. Like it's not enough to just build a community, but um, you need to make sure you're investing time into them, which is what you're obviously doing. So um, keep up the amazing yeah. work. So I, I think uh, people uh, stop at getting followers. Yes. So they write good content. The objective is to get followers, you know, get people to like your article, but they stop there. Mm. Actually, the, the, the meat of this entire um, process is really to know some people. So if you've got a thousand people who like your article, if you can then, you know, build relationship with 10 people uh, who already like your article, they, they know they can do so much uh, with you together with you or for you as well. So um, that that is the key. It's like um, selling food, right? You sell food. You know you serve um, say a hundred customers. You got you got uh, many tables. You know you got hundred customers. So your objective is to get customers to come and visit your restaurant. But people then forget to collect the money. Yes. Your customers sit down and then, you know, sometimes you can, the customers can just leave, right? So you rely on the customer's integrity to, to, mm, to, to pay. pay. But some, sometimes people are so busy, they forgot to pay. Mm. So now, without going and engage, right? You forgot to ask <laughs> the, 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 for the money. So exactly. you have attracted people to come to your restaurant, but some people, very good people, you, you let them go. Uh, without engaging, then you miss a chance to build something beautiful or wonderful together with them. Yeah. But these are the people who already share the same values as you. Yeah. I so for that. me, that is the end game to find out who that is. What can we do together? Can I help the person, or can the person help me? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's the, that that is the end game. And what I like to do is I put all these people because all of them are really like about career. They are really thinking about life. They, they kind of like me uh, well enough to be back regularly. I put them together. So I say, okay, let's have a LinkedIn live. Then I'll just pull people from LA, you know, people from Australia, people from Asia or UK to come together and create a show, a, a LinkedIn live show. We can be talking about social media strategy, talking about leadership. And in June, I'm going to talk about pivot. Oh, we hear, we hear about pivoting in a uh, startup. When you run your own business, something doesn't go well, you pivot to the next business model or the next market. But as professional, we can pivot. So I pivoted from banking to education. So I want to share you know, how I use LinkedIn to do that. Then I'm going to get somebody who is uh, head of uh, Asia for Apple iTunes. Oh, that's a good the one. iTunes store. Fantastic. Yeah, so I'm going to get him uh, to share how he pivoted, how he get the Apple job. <laughs> Before that, you know, he was in consulting. Yeah, I love that. Well, um, Eric, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I know you've got a busy day ahead, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. So I'm going to finish off with a couple of super quick questions. So uh, you have either like a, a, a word or one sentence to answer. So they're going to be quick. So I'm going to quickly jump straight into them. Um, so how many languages do you speak? I I speak 
um, I can present, <laughs> I can do that, this podcast in three languages. Oh, maybe, wow. Maybe four, maybe four. English, Mandarin, Cantonese, these three. And um, I also speak this uh, Hokkien, which, which is a Southern China dialect um, uh, at home with my parents. Amazing. So I think this four, I can do a podcast. <laughs> I can uh, understand a little bit of Japanese and a little bit of Malay. Yeah, fantastic. I, I've also taken Thai classes, <laughs> Thai language classes. Although I cannot speak them now, I cannot speak the language now. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of languages. So, so that's a huge achievement. So I know how hard it is to learn a language, and then to be able to learn it enough to do a podcast uh, and speak it is fantastic. So, um, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Superpower would be to be able. To to quickly know what people um, are suffering from oh. and uh, try to help them. Because a lot of people come to me, sometimes um, I need to decipher, you know, um, yeah. what, like what's wrong, you know, what help they need. Yeah. And uh, hopefully if I can know uh, a bit of their history and what they, how their mind operates, then I can uh, help them better. So Excellent. if there's one superpower that I like, uh, it will be that. I'm already doing it, uh, but I think uh, still not strong enough. Cannot call it a superpower yet. <laughs> well, you're, you know, from my perspective, you're doing a fantastic job and that's a really beautiful one. I love that. Um, and just to finish off, if you could give your 20-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? I think it will be take more risk, um, try, try, try more new things. I've given up. Or oh, I'm not grab opportunities that are presented to me. So when I was younger, um, not 20, maybe like uh, 15. And uh, one of the subjects that I was taking is um, metal works and woodwork. So back then, during my time, there's this technical class where you can train to be a carpenter or, you know, make, make, make things out of metal. I was chosen to participate in a woodwork competition. Oh. Yeah, so my work was so good that I was chosen. Then my friend said, hey, if you're doing woodwork, you know, are you going to make coffee or what? <laughs> and so because of that, I, I didn't go for that competition. You know, I was oh. affected by, by them. I think uh, if I have, uh, when I was young, I don't, no need to conform. Try to have your own thinking when you're presented the opportunity, just uh, grab it. Fantastic. So that's Great. what I would tell myself uh, when I was younger. Great advice. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Eric. It's been an absolute pl pleasure as always. And thank you, um, you know, for just all the wisdom that you take the time to share with your audience and community. We'll put the links to your social handles in the show notes so people can go and follow you. Um, but yeah, keep doing sure. the work that you're doing. You're changing the world and leaving an amazing legacy behind. So um, yeah, looking forward to doing some more fun things together in the future. Yeah, come and uh, join me on my LinkedIn live. Thanks, I would Lisa. Love to. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Yeah, Coco for arranging. <laughs> Thanks, bye.